Lizard. Yeah, I'm Douglas Galvey. Um, you know, I, I love Lizard. It seems to me that uh, you know that that's very much related to the idea that political representation is geographically bounded, and, and politicians want to have control over their channel to the people in the region they represent. So, you know, sort of the, the, the idea of communication policy basically trying to strengthen regional political monopolies seems to me to go a ways to explaining why localism has such a strong sort of political ideological hold. Because it's the idea of, you know, your, your representative, representative power depends on your having control over the channels of the voice, which is the media and people's understanding. But, but what I find interesting is that you know, given the, the, the strength of localism as an idea that you've talked about, is that you know, if you look at radio regulation, the FCC basically nationalized all radio regulation. So if a state prison warden wants to sort of deal with the problem of cell phones, contraband cell phones in the prison, they've got to kind of come to Washington to get permission to install a jammer in their state prison or in their local prison. And the concerns are sort of that the jammer might kind of cause interference on the other side of the street. And to address you know, that very, very local concern, you know, that's argued out in Washington. And, you know, there was, there's, as far as I can tell, I mean, going back, I, I looked at this, that's the beginning of radio regulation. Everybody just said right away, oh, all radio regulation got to be regulated in Washington. There was no idea that let's have some local guys, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, this labor station in Houston, Texas, Voice of Labor. You know, we, we can't have them broadcasting without permission from Washington. And so I, I've never understood why, given all this power of localism, why was the idea that, you know, some Voice of Labor in Houston, you know, they, they shouldn't have to get permission from Washington to, you know, set up a radio station and broadcast to people, you know, eight miles around uh, their, their station. Why is that, you know, is that, has that always been unthinkable? Well, I don't, I don't know if I can answer that um, because it's sort of multifaceted. Uh, the original reason for national control was simply the idea that the electronic frequencies didn't um, stay local. Um, and the idea was that, therefore, we'd have to have at least a national engineer. And once you got the national engineer, then all the other stuff went with it. So they didn't think about it in terms of sort of having split jurisdiction where the FCC could take care of the engineering part of it, the interference part of it, and actually allow local authorities to control some of the reps. That would have been possible, I, I think. It just happened that all of the uh, non-technical stuff got packaged with the technical rationales. Okay, so it all got locked up together. So uh, in contrast to wireline, where we had a split between uh, local at least state and national. In the case of radio, we decided we had to have a national engineering commission, and everything else was packaged with that. But I mean, for example, you know, we now sell spectrum on, in geographic bounded units. We now sell spectrum in geographically bounded units. Well, that's the official way. Uh, well, so, go ahead. But it's very interesting. If you look at those geographic boundaries, they, they tend to avoid political boundaries. And you know, sort of the idea that the FCC couldn't sort of delegate to some political authorities the same way it delegates to private authorities, sort of, you know, a responsibility for managing a geographic spectrum space. I mean, again, that was in between political authorities and private business authorities and spectrum management. Well, I think if, if you're in the spectrum management, I honestly can't think of any worse than having uh, 11,000 municipalities directly in the spectrum. Uh, that would be a nightmare. Uh, or even 50 states, for that matter. Uh, it just wouldn't work. When we talk about inefficiency. You have inf inefficiency uh, cubed, squared, uh, multiplied uh, orders of magnitude. Um, I can only imagine that maybe there is some idea that the FCC could take into account local needs and, and or interests in, in the way in which it breaks up those blocks. But bear in mind, most of, most of the allocations that are made that way, 
they're not tied to any political issues at all. I mean, you started out by talking about the radio stations, radio broadcasting, uh, and how we want, the politicians want to have uh, radio stations in their locale, but that doesn't affect really cell phone radios at all, as far as I can tell. So, I mean, I think there are two, really two different uh, ideas going on here. One is how much do you have to have a local outlet for distinctive local voices? And for me, frankly, a little of that goes a long way, but you could do it without spectrum-based television. You could do it, as I said, you could very easily do it by wire. Uh, and, and get rid of all the spectrum uh, With respect to the other problem, however, this uh, cell phones in prisons, I, I must say, I, I don't know why that needs to be a particular local, what, it, what there is local about that. The FCC could, and surely it's going to be the same from one prison in one state to the next, right? Well, no, in fact, the law currently in Congress authorizes the FCC to consider on a case-by-case -case basis whether a specific prison should be allowed to use a jamming technology. So Congress actually proposes to have the FCC consider on a locality-by-locality -locality basis. Well, that's not quite as silly as it might seem. If, if there are, in fact, local differences, again, then the local differences have to be bound up with an efficient system for managing the spectrum altogether. I don't know about Washington, D.C., but I can guarantee you that the city of Charlottesville wouldn't have a clue about how to go regular things back. Yeah, Glenn, thanks for the uh, wonderful talk and um, so many insights. Uh, I, do, uh, I do feel a little sorry for you. It's, it's remarkable that, you, you know, being cloistered in Charlottesville, <laughs> where you say you don't hear anybody talking about doing away with over-the-air broadcasting. Well, here in Arlington, everybody thinks we should do away with over-the-air broadcasting. Isn't that right, Dean Polson? You have to come to Arlington more. Yeah. Um, and um, in the spirit of um, what you did to Dennis Weissman 25 years ago, uh, uh -oh. <laughs> I, I just, I just want to mention one, one little thing, and that is that it is, it is not the case that the over-the-air TV broadcaster can provide non-broadcast services in the six megahertz allocated to the license. The TV license requires not only the delivery of a primary standard definition over-the-air broadcast signal, uh, now digital on the ATSC standard, it also provides that that broadcast has to emit over the entire six megahertz. Okay, that, that is locked in by virtue of that standard. And that is to say, if you only need one megahertz to do a standard definition channel, you are not allowed to do a one megahertz broadcast and take the other five megahertz and do non-broadcast services. Now that pollution forcing rule was insisted upon by the, act, by the broadcasters when the digital TV standard was crafted because they didn't want outside interest groups coming and saying, you don't need all that six megahertz. You need something less than that to do standard definition. Or you, you might, maybe you should buy more if you want to do high definition and other things, or multiplex. So the, the broadcasters, you know, within the system, quite rationally said, this is the standard. We're going to pollute across all six megahertz, no matter what. And so, and so that's, that's where we are today. Now, in terms of getting Congress to move, in the direction that you, uh, in my opinion, rightfully advocate to allow broadcasters to sell or to reallocate their spectrum to a higher valued use. The, the, the wonderful line that you used in the 1978 university, that wonderful University of Virginia Law Review article uh, describing the licensing process of the FCC as, as professional wrestling full of grunts and groans signifying nothing. And they're still grunting. And the broadcasters are still still providing these services to Congress in terms of the symbiosis between the licensee and the, the incumbent regulator, the incumbent policymaker. And so, you know, losing that, allowing that whole spectrum to just go to common carrier 
wireless communications governed by the market in a competitive environment, that's, that's a big hit for the incumbent, you know, for Congress. And it's Congress that's keeping that there, not the FCC. That's my opinion or my thesis, so I'll let you comment on that. Um, well, I, I don't know, I didn't know that the, about the six megahertz spread you're talking about. I do know that the regulations permit non-broadcast auxiliary services. No, broadcast. No, no, no. Yeah, auxiliary, not, not broadcast auxiliary service. They have to be broadcast. No, no, no. no. They don't have to be. You're thinking in a media sense. I'm no, talking I, about I represent broadcasters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and I've talked to you can, about this, and I've, and I've read, I've read it many times. And you can see, okay, you have to fill all the six see, megahertz. You can open up the paper today and see what says means doing. It's not broadcast. No. It is. Yes, it is. It they, is, they it is over. It is over the six megahertz. It is not free it up. For two way, uh, for, for alternative well, that's services. A, that's a totally different issue. Well, it's not the way you said it. You said, you said that they had to use the full six megahertz for broadcast, and that's not correct. It is correct. It is a broadcast. It's well, not broadcast television. Well, it's not have, broadcast television. The FCC specifically mentions things like paging, so I don't know how you reference all that. It's broadcast. It's one way. Is that no, it's one way. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Well, it's one way. You may be able to figure out a way to go two way, but that's another sort of subtle footnote. But it has to you have to pollute the six megahertz with your broadcast. It's 19.4 megabits per second. It has to it has to be broadcasting the six megahertz. That's what has to happen. Now, you can call these other services non-broadcast because they don't look like broadcast television. Okay? And, and but that's that's irrelevant to what I'm saying about the pollution that has to be there as per the license, the terms of the license. You have to broadcast on that standard. One S T V. Okay. What I, what I should have said is it doesn't have to be television. Right. Uh, and That's so true. the question becomes, can you multicast these other services within some mode that would serve mobile wireless purposes? Can we call them together? My understanding is you can't. No, it's very difficult to go two ways the case, because I'm you've already sorry. got the pollution there. You, you, you have the one-way high-powered broadcast that has to be there. You can deliver non-television services, but that broadcast has to go on from the transmitter. Yeah. Regarding the Comcast Detroit decision, um, I read the amicus brief. I believe you might have been involved with it. That Right, right. That basically eviscerated every possible means by um, which the FCC would try to hang its hat for ancillary jurisdiction. And at the end of that, I, I thought to myself, well, this was beautifully written, and I thought, well, does it prove too much in a way? Because, I mean, obviously the FCC, a day before, could have called uh, broadband telecommunications. And mm -hmm. according to Brand X, uh, there was enough ambiguity mm -hmm. that they probably would have gone to Chevron deference, deference mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. So the day before, they could have regulated it as common carrier, basically. But the day after, they pronounced it Title I. Presumably, they have no regulatory authority at all. And I was thinking, well, what if Comcast or Verizon or whoever were to do something truly egregious mm -hmm. um, in terms of its uh, broadband uh, uh, facilities truly discriminatory and, and non, you know, not revealing things to customers, uh, and putting aside whether market forces would have uh, would work on them. But what if they were to do something truly egregious? Is the implication that the FCC literally has no power at this point now that they've deregulated them to um, say to them you can't do it, or would the DOJ even have any power after Trinko and all that? Uh, well. Uh, um First of all, the egregiousness of what Comcast uh, might do, um, I, I, they may have already done it. I, mean, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't say that what uh, Comcast did was proper. Um, what they did was pretty dumb, I um, think. But you know, they. But I think the point is, you can't have, you can't, you can't just sort of slice this any way you want. Every, every Monday there's this policy. Every Wednesday there's that policy. The FCC uh, went down the road of saying, we don't want to regulate these as telecommunications carriers. 
There's at least, in fact, they didn't say we don't want to 